Hi guys, today we're gonna to talk about group communication. So like it or not, groups are just a part of our everyday lives. So you have to communicate in groups in school, in the workplace, often with your family. So it is important for us to really understand the different roles and tasks that come with communicating in groups and looking at how to best do that effectively. Today we're just gonna take one portion of that and we're gonna look at what group roles are, how they develop, what are some of the ways that we develop group norms, and then looking at leadership and power within groups. So the first thing we're gonna take a look at is this idea of roles. So when we're thinking about group communication, we have multiple roles within a group. And so we really divide these into two, task roles or social roles. Now task roles are really designed around the things that we are producing for the group. So these can be things like taking notes, maybe you are the researcher, they are very task oriented assignments. Social roles are things that we do that deal with group cohesiveness. So in every group we have both a task role and a social role and sometimes we have multiple task roles. But social roles kind of think about things like, um, one example would be the leader. That is a social role. Your whole function is to bring about the group and help assign tasks and make sure people are on track. But there are many different roles that we can encompass. And sometimes those roles change depending on the group. So maybe you're a leader in one group, but you are a follower in another. So very sort of situationally dependent, um, but we'll look at some of these different behaviors and roles and talk about how we can use them effectively. You're gonna see a fairly large list. I'm not gonna go through every single one, um, but I am going to highlight a few social roles that are important. So again, social roles, these are the things that we do that deal with relationships within the group. So in your social role, you wanna have a variety of these in your group in order to create a well-rounded group and one that kind of coexists in harmony and really is, has the best uh, sort of chance of producing good content. So social roles are just as important as task roles in getting the job done. So some important social roles you might wanna make sure that you are including. One would be a harmonizer. So this person helps modify any disputes. They keep us sort of focused on the task and not let us get too into the personal thing, but they are that moderator or that person that keeps the peace. It's a very important person to have. A gatekeeper. This is often an underutilized social role, but a really important one. The gatekeeper helps make sure that everyone has a voice. Sometimes in groups, you can have a very dominant person. And so people who are shy or maybe intimidated by that person may not feel that they can stand up and you know, offer their opinion or speak. So a gatekeeper is very good about making sure that every single person has that opportunity. So they make sure to ask, you know, Sarah, how, what do you feel about this? What's your suggestion? Tom, what's your suggestion? Um, Denise, what's your suggestion? So that way we can move through and make sure everyone is heard. Without a gatekeeper, again, sometimes you just have one dominant person and everyone kind of follows behind them. So it's really important to make sure that everyone's voices and ideas are heard because that makes a more creative and well-rounded group. Followers are also really important. It's that whole saying about chiefs and Indians. You can't have a bunch of leaders and no followers because then you don't get anything done, but you also can't have a group entirely of followers without anyone to guide you. So it's important to have a nice balance of those who wanna follow and those who wanna lead. Another great group role that sometimes can become a distraction, but if used correctly is very nice, is a tension reliever. So sometimes you just need that person to crack a joke, um, to throw in a funny video. Again, as long as it doesn't get the group too off track, having that tension reliever is really nice just to make sure that you know, we don't get too intense and we don't take ourselves too seriously. So those are some of the different social roles that people can encompass in their groups. We're looking at task roles. Again, these are dealing with very specific tasks that are assigned to the group. And again, another long list here, but just gonna highlight a few of these. And there are more in your textbook as well. So if you're thinking about some task roles, a really good one is an elaborator. So this person will take all the information that's been given and just help 
kind of extrapolate that information, provides comments. They are sort of the more detail-oriented person. Initiator or contributor, this person offers different perspectives, so they're a good person to have. Your information seekers are your researchers. So sometimes in particular groups or teams, you have that one person that really loves to compile all that research and bring it in. Your coordinator, make sure that everyone has a task and that those tasks are being done. They help coordinate you know, how those tasks are being sort of divided out and update on progress, making sure that everything is where it needs to be. And then your energizer. So this is somebody who keeps the group moving forward. Sometimes we need that person to make sure that we're meeting deadlines, we're not procrastinating. Task roles can either be assigned, um, so especially in like work group and teams, you might be assigned a particular task, whereas maybe in school groups, if you have a group project, you have to figure out who's doing what. One of the best ways to make sure that your group is communicating effectively is to look at this list and figure out who is going to do what and actually assign it out as a group. The more you can be specific with your group members about what each person's task is, the better that group will come together, will get the work done, and it just keeps us from getting into miscommunication about who's doing what and the deadlines and things like that. So if your tasks are not assigned, I would sit down and really make sure that you are assigning these out and giving some variety, right? We don't want everyone to be an information seeker. We don't want everybody to be a coordinator. Those could be very specific tasks for very specific people. The most harmonious groups and the most effective groups are ones that include a variety of those two types. So we also have these things called anti-group roles. And these are sometimes roles that people adopt that actually negatively contribute to a group. So they can decrease effectiveness, they can get us off track, they can cause tension. So some of those could be an aggressor. So this is someone who very much believes that their way is the right way and they are not going to let anyone else speak. They're very big about pushing their own agenda. And sometimes we have those in groups. Maybe if you're very passionate about your idea, you can turn into aggressor, maybe on accident, maybe on purpose, but you are so married to that idea that you're not willing to hear anybody else out and you think your way is the right way. Blocker negative, these are the people who just don't want to do anything and so they think every idea is terrible and they don't offer solutions. They're not solutions oriented. They are just like, this is a problem, this is a problem, but not willing to work on it. Um, a joker, again, like I said, the tension reliever is a positive social role, but can turn into an anti-group role if it becomes too off track. I know you've probably had those groups where you know, the group could not keep doing what it was supposed to do because one person just kept sharing memes or again, funny YouTube videos, and then you got down the YouTube hole and it just went, became a whole thing. So sometimes that joker can be an anti-group role if it gets to be too excessive. And then last one, dominator, is one that we see often, again, just takes over and no one has a voice. So we wanna try to avoid these anti-group roles because they do decrease effectiveness and often cause um, some tension in the group. So in addition to having group roles, in a group, whether, again, it's a work group or a team or maybe a social group, you also start to develop some norms. Norms are the expected behaviors of that particular group. And they are particular to every group and team that you are a part of. So we have two types of norms. First are formal norms. Those are things that are explicitly stated. So they're written down in a rule book or they are on a piece of paper, they are explicitly stated by that group. So for example, if you're a member of a sports team, there are specific rules that you follow as part of the game. You probably wear a uniform. Those are all considered to be formal norms. Informal norms are those adopted by that particular group and they're just more socially agreed upon than explicitly stated. Let's take a work example. Um, formal norms, these are things that are going to be outlined in your sort of uh, employee handbook. You know, things that you're like dress code, um, you know, sexual harassment, those types of things are norms that are formal. They are in some cases governed by law, but they are explicitly stated. You know when you sign that contract that you have to follow these things. Informal norms in a workplace might be things like start time. Maybe your job doesn't have a specific start time. 
maybe it's just generally ac accepted that you show up somewhere between 8 and 9 a.m. and you leave somewhere between 5 and 6 p.m., okay? So those would be more informal norms. It is really the best idea when you are getting in a group and a team, so especially let's think about like a real world example for you guys, if you're working with other students on a group project. The more you can formalize your norms, the better and more effective that group will be. A lot of times when we have tension or miscommunication in groups, it's because we do not have formally agreed upon norms. Let's take a very simple example and think about um, a meeting time. So let's say in a real world example, your group is supposed to meet at two o'clock at Midway Cafe. We always have that one person that doesn't show up, right? Or we don't know where they are. So if you are relying on informal norms, you just might assume that, you know, maybe they're just gonna text, um, maybe you're not gonna hear from them. There is no agreed upon way that you're going to communicate that absence. Whereas if in the beginning of the formation of the group, you say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. If you can't meet at that time, you need to send a text or email you know, a half an hour before. That is a formal norm. That's been agreed upon by the group. You've talked it out. And so that is what you will expect from every group member moving forward. Again, that could alleviate some tension, right? You now know that person's not gonna be there. You have a system for how you're going to include them if they're not there. You have talked it through. Another thing that is a good example here are things like being late or start time. If you don't formalize what late means, so meaning you need to be there at two o'clock, anything past that is late. Well, late to me, I'm always somebody who's 10 minutes early. So that I would agree with that definition of being late is if I'm not there by the start time, then I am late. My middle sister, gosh, I mean, she figures if she shows up anywhere between two and 2.30, she's fine. She's never anywhere on time. But that's, you know, that's her perception of being on time. That would annoy me as a group leader. So she didn't show up on time, but to her, she thinks she's still on time. So really specking some of that stuff out and being very specific about that will help you create a very cohesive and effective group. Think about how are you going to contribute? Is every gonna, everybody gonna contribute to a Google Doc? So the more you can talk out those particulars and specifics and create some formal norms, the more effective your groups can be. So when we're talking about effectiveness, we really are getting this idea of cohesiveness. And we know that groups and teams are cohesive from a couple of different um, characteristics. One, a group will generally use we language when they're cohesive. They want to be part of the group. So for example, if I talk about Nash, I use we because I'm a part of Nash and it's a pretty cohesive group, right? I want to be identified with that group, so I use we language. So that's an, a definite identifier of a cohesive group. If you establish and maintain group traditions, so this is why, especially for HR departments and organizations, like formal celebrations of birthdays or employee recognition, there is a reason for those. It's not just for fun. It is this idea that the more you establish those traditions, the more bought in and cohesive people feel. So it's very purposeful why organizations do those types of celebrations. And then cohesive groups encourage everyone to participate, right? There's not normally a dominant voice. Everyone feels heard or is able to participate in some capacity. So those can be some marks of cohesiveness. If you're thinking about status, you can tell status in a group. The person who talks the most is likely one of the higher ranking individuals in the group. That's just generally the more airtime you have, the more powerful you are in that group. We generally think leaders are the ones who stand up and talk to us. Um, and there are also people who are listened to by group members. So it's very easy to tell if your people are bought in or if they agree with that leadership status by how they respond to that person. And we're gonna talk about leadership in a minute and how one gains power. Okay, so we're gonna look at a couple styles of leadership and there are several. This is not an exhaustive list you will find. This is a, a whole body of research and different people have 
suggestions for different ways you should lead, but we're just gonna highlight a few. The first style of leadership is this idea of the trait approach. And that style of leadership says that leaders are born, not made. Meaning, you're either born with leadership qualities or you're not. It is not something that can be cultivated within you. Like leaders are just naturally born people. A lot of times you think about very charismatic people fall into this category. So for example, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., a captivating speaker, a very charismatic individual, people were drawn to him because of his persona, his charisma. So one would argue that he would fall under trait leadership where those uh, characteristics of his personality were just innate to him. It's not that he necessarily had to build those, he just became a natural leader because people were drawn to those um, characteristics or those qualities. So that's one style. And that can work um, for certain organizations, certain teams. Sometimes you see like nonprofits are built around sort of one person's idea and they're very charismatic and bring people on. So that could be a way that trait leadership works in a sort of career work capacity. But that's not very often. Um, we don't see a lot of trait leadership in organizations. Um, actually, a great example of this not working out so well is the company we work. That was very much built off of this like charismatic leader and it kind of fell apart and they ended up going bankrupt. Um, so sometimes it doesn't always play out so well in the business world. We see a lot more of functional leadership approach. So functional leadership means that these leaders can lead one of two ways depending on what is most needed. If we're looking at task motivated leaders, these are people who are concerned about bottom lines, about getting things done. They are not concerned about hurting people's feelings or relationships in the workplace. Um, so take like maybe, this is an outdated example, but a newsroom, right? So you have a deadline, you've got to get stuff out. You don't care if you're hurting Sally's feelings or Jamal's feelings because you need to get that paper out. So you were only focused on the task, don't care about the relationships. That can work very well in short bursts, right? If we're under a deadline, again, if it's a life and death situation, you are on you know, a member of like a firefighting squad. You can't be concerned about relationships so much because the task is so important. Or operating rooms, that would be another great example. So task approach, task leaders can really work well if it's in short bits and you're coming up against a deadline or again, a life and death type of situation. But we wouldn't want to be that type of leader all the time because we would not have a lot of relationships with our um, people underneath us and we probably wouldn't foster the most positive working environment. So not something that's sustainable long term. Relationship motivated leaders care more about the relationships between employees. They care more about the rela their relationships with their employees uh, and they are just more focused on creating a relationships first environment. Yes, we need to get the task done, but we are more concerned about how cohesive this group is, how bought in everyone is than we are about the tasks. So that can be another approach. Again, that works very well unless you have something that really needs to be pushed forward. You have a lot of deadlines. So sometimes you would want to flip back and forth between these two. That's the most effective use of functional approach. Sometimes you want to be a task motivated leader and sometimes you want to be a relationship motivated leader. So using them interchangeably. And then we have styles approach. So these are just general styles of leadership. Um, authoritarian leaders, these are your sort of dictators would be a great example. Um, so these leaders make the choices and they expect people to follow. The military is an excellent example of this type of leadership. Democratic leaders. So the idea here is they consult everyone, allow everyone to participate in the decision-making process. That can be great because um, people buy in, they feel like they're part of it, but again, sometimes you don't have the time or resources that it takes to have that style. And then laissez-faire leaders, these sound like they would be the, the best, but honestly, this can be quite troublesome from an organization. And laissez-faire leaders are just kind of like, meh, I don't care, you guys do what you want. I actually had a boss like this in the past where she was like, oh, you write your job description. You tell me what you're gonna do. That sounds like it would be really cool, 
but it actually was very frustrating because we as employees kind of wanted some structure and some guidance and instead we just had someone who was kind of hands off. So a lot of times laissez-faire leaders are people who maybe have been promoted because they've been at a place for so many years um, and they might be promoted because of longevity but not necessarily because they are great leaders. They have leadership characteristics. So laissez-faire leaders can often be very troublesome in organizations because they are not prepared to lead a group, but they get that opportunity based on seniority. So those are some of the different styles of leadership that we can employ. The last thing we're gonna talk about is how a leader comes to power. So there are many different ways that leaders assume power in groups, teams, or organizations. The first is legitimate power, and this comes from title. So we often see that someone is given legitimate power when they have a particular title in organization or like here we talk about a teacher. So you walk into the classroom, we automatically give the teacher some power because they are identified as the instructor for that um, section or that course and that is a natural power difference between instructor and student, right? So we give power based off of their title. Um, I have a department head, so she naturally is given some power because that is her formal title. She has very specific duties. So we, I look up to her um, as a, a source of power within my organization based on title. So that would be an example of legitimate power. So we see this a lot in very, um, you know, sort of traditional organizations generally have a power structure. Coercive power. This is my favorite one to talk about, although not the best type of leadership. This comes from a person's ability to threaten or harm you. So maybe your sister has coercive power over you because she has some embarrassing photos that she's blackmailing you with. That would be coercive power. Um, Hitler was an ex excellent example of someone who gained coercive power. He gained power by fear, by the threat that he was going to harm and did harm many people. Voldemort, if you're a Harry Potter fan, would also be another example of coercive power. So we generally don't want these type of leaders. We try to avoid them at all costs, but they do tend to rise very quickly from a place of low power to a place of high power. They obviously don't stay there for very long uh, because you can only hold that type of power for so long, but they are people who go quickly from top to bottom or from bottom to top. The third is similar, it's reward power. So these people gain power by the rewards that they can give someone. So let's say you won the lottery. I'm gonna guess you're now going to have reward power over all your friends because they're gonna want to think about what you can give them. And so I'll be your best friend, just give me a boat, a vacation, whatever it is you want to bestow upon me. But that relationship and that sort of um, somewhat, uh, followers, ability to follow that person and their desire to continue to support that person will go away once the rewards are no more. So it is a false type of power because you're only held by the sort of things that you can give others. It doesn't have to be tangible things. Maybe you are a well-connected individual and people flock to you because you can you know, recommend them for jobs or connect them with other high-flying individuals. It's not a very, you know, deep relationship, right? The minute you can't do them favors anymore, they're probably going to cut ties with you because you can't give them anything else. So reward power, again, can come and make you a very popular person or a very powerful person, but it's a very false power because people are not bought into you or your message. Expert power. This comes when you are considered an expert on the subject. So for example, if you go into the wilderness with a guide, well, they know how to keep you alive. So it doesn't matter you know, if they're 10 years younger than you, if they have no education, they're still going to be the person that you resort to and consider to be the leader and the power person in the group because they have the skills that will keep you alive. So expert power comes from knowledge. And referent power is the last one. This comes from respect. So people who have referent power have that because people like and respect them. Um, so I put here an example would be a preacher or a pastor. They generally have referent power with their congregation. People come because they identify with that particular person um, and they see them as someone who shares their values and 
they really enjoy who they are. So referent power is a very lasting bond. If you can establish referent power, then likely people are very bought in to you and your leadership. So today we looked a little bit at task roles, social roles, how we develop norms, the different styles of leadership, and how we come to power. So those are all really great things to know in order to understand how groups form and operate. In our next video, we'll talk a little bit about how groups come and make decisions and how we can more effectively work within those groups.